So what we're going to cover today are three main points, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A like Khaled said. So first we're going to talk about why do we actually know about DOE adoption? What's our history with this? Then we're going to talk about what the keys to a successful DOE adoption that we've seen are and kind of the distilled wisdom that we've learned from our customers. I'm going to finish with that section and then Ross is going to take over and he's going to talk about what a successful rollout looks like using the example of two of our customers who are quite different in their organizations but follow some of the same definitely the same keys to success and then there's some key differences as well that he'll cover then we'll move on like i said to q a great so let's get started why do we know doe adoption well if you're somewhat familiar with synthase you might know that our experience was that we started as a company who was a CRO with an idea that we could do better biology with DOE. So it was really in the fabric of the founding of this company in 2011. However, in 2016, we decided that it would actually be better to be a software company and to bring the tools of the biology that we were using to greater audiences. So that's what got developed around 2016. And then by 2018, we were deploying software DOE solutions. Now, since then, we've been in 45 or more companies. We've had over 90 deployments of our software, so into multiple labs within certain companies. We've been in nine different countries across the globe, and it should be said one global pandemic, which deploying complex technology like this that brings together software, robots, biology, in a pandemic was quite the challenge, but we did it. But DOE specifically, in our customers, we have about 90% of them who use our DOE capabilities and who come to soft synthase because of our DOE expertise. So they might be doing all sorts of applications or they might be using our RoboColumns application, but they are customers who are using this in our current product. So we have a big influx of working with different people all the time. We've also been doing this for almost five years now since we've been um, having customers in DOE. And we've got nine different ways people actually execute DOEs. So it could be manually, it could be with dispensers like the Dragonfly, and it could be with larger liquid handlers like a Tekken. And with all of these different cases, we've seen a wide range of things. So our companies that we work with are everything from large pharma, medium biotech, small startups, and they come from all sorts of industries. Obviously, anything with a biological lab is going to be somebody we might work with but you can see they have a, a variety of applications. We also work with different departments. So assay dev is quite popular, obviously for something like DOE, but we work with cell line development, USP, DSP, bioprocessing, you name it, we've seen it. So because we've seen so much, you can start to pick out the trends. Now in my previous life, like Khaled said, I was a biomedical engineer and a data scientist. So I'm all about picking out trends from data sets. And what I've noticed, I've distilled in this presentation into the three keys for successful DOE adoption. And this is across the board. So this is whether your industry is different, your use case is different, your department is different. This is what I see people doing that make this stick well. Now, it should be said that I've seen a lot of people do this badly. That's also how we learn about it. Um, and so I thank those customers who have showed me not just the great achievements, but also the scars. So the three keys are as follows. Number one is know your why, and I'll get into the details of these following this. Number two is building a ramp plan, and number three is the right people at the right time. So if we talk about knowing your why, why is, in my opinion, the most important. It's the, the reason that you're doing DOE in your organization, the reason you're bringing in new technology. It's the North Star of your rollout, right? So you're not just implementing a cool tool that Synthase told you about. You're trying to actually achieve something. What we do with our customers in a regular basis is we agree on something we call the definition of success. So this is actually taken from one of our customer um, kickoff slides where we sit down when they start to work with us and we talk about what are you trying to get out of this? What is your actual goal for improvement and transformation within your scientific function? And it's really a value statement. Where are we trying to get to? It's not a mechanics of how we're getting there. It's what do we want to get to? So when we formalize this with our customers and we suggest that you formalize this when you're doing a DOE adoption, 
Um, here are some examples. So one is, they're both from customers. I won't name them. One is a bit stronger than the other. So if we look at the first one, it's to, to enable our development team to confidently deliver assays and empower scientists to achieve greater insights in less time. Now, notice I've talked nothing about tools of how we're gonna get there. I've talked nothing about the methodology. All I'm trying to get at is where are we going and why are we doing it, right? There is another example that's a weaker example, in my opinion, that's to implement DOE to increase productivity and throughput of assays. Now, the two of these might look the same in an execution standpoint, but the people that you bring along on your journey and the way that you roll out adoption within an organization number one is much more inspiring, right? The more inspiring, the better. The reason in number one, if I'm a scientist on the ground, I can see why I want to buy into this idea and technique in the first place. On the second one, that sounds like somebody in an office somewhere made a decision about productivity and now it's become my problem, right? So personally, I find the first one much better as a why than the second one. There's also a tip here. So this is a tip I use for myself, a trick I use for myself, but also one that our customers use when they do this successfully. So it's not just to know your why, but it's to write it down. And writing it down does two things. One, it allows you to formalize your thinking and at least for somebody like me, not be so scattered in all the ideas at once, right? Really nail down on the, on the big idea. And second, it helps you to communicate that idea to others. The thing with DOE adoption is you can't go it alone, especially no matter which organization you're in, but even in a big one or a small one, you really can't go it alone. So you've got to communicate to people all the time about why you're doing this, why you're pushing for this, why this is something that's going to transform your organization. So the second tip there is to communicate it excessively. We all know a lot of businesses repeating ourselves, right? And sometimes that's just how things get done. So I'd encourage you to know it and to talk about it a lot. Right, so now that you know your why, the second successful thing we see people do is to build a ramped plan. Now, we like a step framework and I've taken this from literature on rolling out digital solutions in a classroom. It's called the SAMR framework and it builds up the way that technology and digital solutions can change the working practices in an organization. So in the substitution phase, what you're looking for, that's your first phase, and it's just replacing your old tech with your new tech. Your process doesn't change, but you're just replacing it. The second stage is augmentation. So now that you've established how to use the new tech, you're going a bit further and you're getting some functional improvement in your working patterns because you've got the tech, but you're not doing any sort of major overhaul. That's what comes in in modification. So in the modification stage, you then have your processes that you can redefine or change because you have this technology, right? So as opposed to changing the process and finding a technology, you realize, ah, now that we've got a new technology like DOE, we can actually change the way we do things for the better. And then in redefinition, that's kind of the final phase. So that's the unforeseen possibilities that arise. Working practices look very different than when you started in substitution. Um, things are things are quite different and, and you see a lot more revitalization of how you do things. So if we look at an example that hopefully everybody can understand, one of those is electronic communication. So back in the day, we used to send paper memos at the office and that was the way that you got your ideas across to colleagues, to other people in the organization. And then one day the electronic memo came along. Now that's still long form uh, writing, it's still, you know, with a purpose and a title and you're capturing all your ideas. It's not a conversation, it's a statement, it's a thesis. And that's how you might print it and hand it to your colleague down um, the way, but everything's done electronically. So that's straight substitution. Written memo from ele to electronic memo, but the process is all the same. Augmentation came in when all of a sudden you could start sending these electronic memos and instead of printing it and dispersing it, you were sending it to a colleague and you were realizing that they would probably see it within a short period of time. But if you think of how an email's written, it's still more or less long form text. You know, you have, hello, Ross, you write your long email, you sign off your name, you try to capture all your ideas in the one area and you're not looking for a quick back and forth. It's still kind of long form communication. Modification came in 
when we started taking that technology and doing much more short form communication, things like instant messaging, things like shorter emails, all of a sudden we realized our response rates were a lot higher and our response time was a lot lower. So we could modify the way we communicated with each other because we had a tool that allowed us to do that. And then Slack is kind of the redefinition of electronic communication, right? No longer is it a one-to-one -one conversation. Now you've got multiple channels going on. You've got multiple DMs going on. It's a totally different way of doing electronic communication that couldn't have been possible without the steps before it, but was never imagined when the electronic memo came out. Now, with these four stages, you want to make them count, right? And you wanna make sure that you have measurable objectives at every stage. My advice is to pick three. I know scientists, we are a thorough bunch. We like to think of every possibility, but I really have worked with so many brilliant people in my career, aerospace engineers, mathematicians, biomedical engineers, scientists, business people, and I really believe that most people can't think about more than three things at once. So I encourage you to pick three. Here are some examples from some of our customers. Now I'm not gonna read all of these because it's a lot of text, but I'll pick out a couple of them. So some people try to get DOE into their organization and their goal might be to democratize, to, excuse me, democratize this high skill technique by increasing the number of scientists in their lab who can use it. Now, this is what they're trying to buy software like ours for that makes that process easier, but it's really about trying to instill DOE into the scientific culture by increasing the number of people who might use it. Another one is further down, and it's a little less quantitative arguing with the point that I just made because the quantitative ones are quite good, but increasing confidence in decision-making. This is something Ross is gonna talk about with one of our customers. This was one of their biggest gains, and it's a bit, qualitative to have as a metric, but it's really powerful and it's a really good reason to make the change. And then the final one, which Ross will touch on as well, is to spend less time investigating dead-end assays. You know, spend less time because you have more confidence that you've covered the space that you're interested in. Now, this all sounds very simple in theory. However, like I said, we've all worked with scientists and they love thoroughness. So, if you've ever tried to have a conversation with a scientist about priorities and you put forward two or three, immediately you get, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? Because we are thinkers. We like to think of the whole space. So an exercise that we tend to go through with customers, and we went through this with one of our customers who came to us with a 200 line specification of what they were trying to achieve. We said, right, <laughs> nobody's going to be happy with 200 goals. Um, we will never achieve any of that is a prioritization exercise. Now, I call it priority survivor, you can call it whatever you want, but it's basically to get you and your group to write down every single thing that's important, right? So here are all my important um, metrics that I'd like to achieve. And so we write them all down, we get that thoroughness out there, and then we say, okay, now, if I had to pick only half that are more important than the rest of them, which ones would I pick? And then you play the game again. Okay, so now I've got four. Out of these four, which one do I pick if I only can keep half? And it starts to whittle down as an exercise and gives you your main objectives, your secondary objectives, and then your nice to haves. So if you're thinking to yourself, it's insane I could get my group to settle on three things, try it this way. It tends to capture the need to be thorough with the focus of prioritization. Then, once you've decided on your metrics, you want to establish those for each stage of the plan. So, excuse me, you're doing it at each stage of the plan. So, your metrics for substitution are going to be different than your metrics for modification, right? Because you've moved along in your adoption journey. So, here's an example I, I put together for DOE. So, it could be, and I've, I've just picked one for this example, not three, because it's too much information. It could be that during substitution, you're just trying to optimize 80% of your assays with DOE and 20% with OFAT or whatever you were doing before. So this obviously assumes that you're optimizing as a general working practice, but now you're just shifting that technology from OFAT or something else to DOE. Then in the augmentation phase, you might build on that 
by saying, right, now we want to increase our certainty of decision making by making sure we're investigating the DOE space before we go into decisions about the fate of an assay, let's say. In the modification stage, you might actually change how you do your assay acceptance criteria. So it might be that your processes for how this moves along downstream is actually going to change. That has to say, you have to have a DOE study. That's the only way we're going to accept any sort of acceptance decision. And that might be the change that you make in the modification stage and the goal that you have during that phase. Then redefinition, I like to put a question mark. The reason being is because I think it's a bit far in the future for me to boldly project. Um, and also redefinition is really supposed to be the unknown possibility, right? So it's the thing that comes out of all this that you didn't see coming. So I'll leave that one as an unknown. This is very basic advice, but I would be remiss not to give it, which is don't forget to actually capture these things. Some of the things that we see people do is that they try to go after thoroughness and what they sacrifice on the way is achievable things they can capture, right? So I really recommend that less experiments with achievable data is much more vital than more with unachievable data. I always encourage people too, that if you hit those low, the, a low number of experiments that you can actually capture and actually validate your metrics with, you can always add on, right? Nobody's, nobody's stopping that sort of progress, but it's hard to go to shoot for the moon if you've not got somewhere that's going to make sure that you at least land on some sort of metric capture. The other advice I tend to give clients is use what you're already doing. Um, if you're tight on time and you don't have a specialized team that goes around validating things, use what you're doing. Don't go look for special cases. Pick a couple that are, are good cases. And Ross will talk about how some of our clients did this in their practice. Finally, this is just my own personal thought, make sure it's documented and presented, right? It gives you and other people the confidence that moving through those SAMR stages is actually building up to something good. You know. This is coming back to this idea of communicating excessively, showing people what works at what stage and why it works and showing that documentation of progress is very important to making adoption happen throughout the organization. Right, so we know why we're doing things. We've built a rant plan and now it's time to think about the people and not just the people in general, but which people at which time, right? I've worked for a startup for almost six years now, and the name of the game is always doing the right thing at the right time. So this is no different. If we go back to our SAMR framework, what we recommend doing with DOE is in the substitution phase, starting with your scientific innovators. These are the people who are really gonna help you kick the tires, make sure things are going well, um, work out all the kinks. They're the ones that are really just invested for the sake of cool tech then you bring in your scientific team these are the people that probably don't want to change how they work they probably kind of have to be pushed along into it don't bring them in in the substitution phase they're not the people that are going to love a new method and want to play with it then we've got excuse me cross-functional teams tend to come in in the modification stage so this might be people that are looking at no go no go decisions people in downstream functions that aren't doing DOE themselves, but start talking about it as being a part of their criteria. And then unrelated teams is the question mark of the redefinition stage, right? So that's, that's where these tend to come in. So how do you find the right people at the right time? These are some questions that could help you determine who, who to bring in when, especially with that scientific innovator phase. I think people that are interested in the technology for the technology's sake, people that like trying new things, people that are naturally interested. I love to suggest to people that it's a great thing for more junior members of staff to try to play with something new and really build their career with interesting technology. You know, those are great people because they tend to be a bit more eager. They tend to be a bit less stuck in how to do things. And it's a great opportunity for them. You can also think about how you might build your teams during your plan, how that could work. And I'll talk a bit more about that in the next slide. And you know, make sure your plan takes into account working patterns. A plan without people is just a framework on a page, right? You really need these people to help you pull it off. And then my final question there is a bit cheeky, which is what's the last department you would think would care about DOE, but you know when you've got finance saying it, you've hit that redefinition stage. 
So building those right internal teams for success, we've seen people do it a few different ways and there's some critical kind of models that help. So you usually have in a group, your super users or your scientific innovators, those really clever people that really wanna get into the technology. And then you've got the rest of your scientific team who are carrying out important work, but are a little less jazzed about bringing in a new tool. So the way we see people tend to do this is one of two things. Either they pair these super users with a few of the scientific team. Now, this would probably be during your modification stage, right? So your, your substitution stage is all scientific innovators. It's, I, I think it, it'll be more harm than good sometimes to bring in the scientific team because things just start to get clouded, nothing gets done. So those innovators are really critical during that first point. So either they bring them in during the design phase and the decision sign off, but then the execution, the results interpretation, some of the design as well is all done by the wider team. We've also seen people when they're starting out having those innovators only doing the design and the interpretation and sign off, but you have the rest of the scientific team who helps with the execution. That can be a really easy way to get people into it without putting the results and all the weight of interpretation on the scientific team's shoulders right from the get-go. So I've tried to give some of the wisdom that we've learned from our customers over the last five years. It's very quickly distilled into these three points. And now I'm gonna hand over to Ross because he's the one who's spent a lot of time on the ground with our end users. And he's gonna tell you about two of the companies that got this right. Okay, there we go. Uh, thank you very much, Lauren. Um, I hope everybody can sort of see my slides okay. Um, right, so yeah, as Lauren said, what I'd like to talk to you all about today is just walk you through uh, a couple of different use cases, uh, case studies, I guess, of where we've seen DOE uh, rolled out within two different organizations um, and, and how what we've seen work well. So, uh, for, for these case studies, I want to sort of take two of our different uh, customers from completely opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, so we work with a range of different organizations, but um, these two really couldn't be more different from each other. So we have one customer, they're a large pharmaceutical organization, they're a global company, they're spread across multiple sites, um, and they're trying to implement DOE across those multiple sites, right? Um, they also have different groups and departments that are using DOE and looking to uh, implement it into their work. They're very well established. As I say, they're a large company, and so this can bring with itself its, its own sort of cultural challenges, and I'll discuss some of these in, in a second. Uh, and then finally, they're probably no surprise, they're a big pharma company. They're very well resourced, right? And so they have lots of internal resources that they can touch on to, to sort of help uh, roll out change across their organization. And then on the other hand, we have a small biotech that we work with here in the UK. Uh, there are about 50 employees. They're a fairly new company. They're a startup, so they're still going through sort of funding rounds and, and, tr and trying to raise money. So they don't have a lot to spare. Um, and they're working in the sort of bioprocessing and, and cell culture space. Whereas our large pharma company are at the moment sort of working more in uh, the groups we work with, at least in drug discovery. So why does this matter? Well, I want to take a second just to walk you through um, some of the different challenges uh, and approaches that both of these organizations have taken in implementing DOE. So let's start off by discussing our large pharma organization. And I first of all just really want to frame the, the goals and the value of this DOE rollout that they've recently gone through and just highlight uh, really their why, right? What are they trying to achieve from rolling out DOE? Uh, and the first point really is probably not that surprising, but they're looking to achieve successful adoption of DOE within their organization. This was something that they tried previously a, a number of times in the past and always been able to get some momentum and get some users engaged in, in using designer experiments, but have never really been able to get wide traction um, for a number of different reasons. I mean, DOE is technically quite challenging. There's a lot to learn. Uh, it also requires uh, 
technologies. You know, people are commonly using automation, um, but they really wanted to focus on getting this uh, adoption of DOE and having lots of users and lots of new members of their teams take it up and use it. They were looking to implement DOE across multiple groups within their discovery group, not just uh, one small set of users, but a, a large number of users, and we'll, we'll look a little bit more of the numbers in a second. And finally, and I think critically, they wanted to ensure that the change they made was, was long-term and that it was a real cultural change in the way people think about their science and the way they approach experimental challenges. Uh, change management has, probably doesn't come as much of a surprise to a lot of you, can be really hard in large companies, um, particularly if you've got disparate groups, and different teams of people, um, and we'll look at some of the, the keys that Lawrence discussed and how that sort of relates to this, this cultural change. So <clears throat> with those goals, there's always going to be some challenges as well, right? And so I think I've touched on a couple of them just there, but really to highlight these, I think that the biggest challenges are can be around uh, company culture, like I say, in a big organization with many moving parts achieving stable and consistent change and change management can be a challenge, right? Uh, particularly with something as, as technically complicated as designing experiments. And there's also then the scientific challenges as well. Part of the assessment process of DOE for this organization was, well, is it able to solve our biological problems? They work in a highly complex biological space and they wanted to be sure that DOE is actually the right solution for them. They also wanted to ensure that there was site-to-site uh, -site consistency in um, both in terms of the biology, but also uh, the sort of training and, and learning process of educating people to use DOE. Um, and also part of, again, being in a bigger company where you've got different groups that are all having to interact with each other. So let's say you have a, a group that's producing some reagents for an assay. You have your assay development team, and then you have a high throughput screening team that's maybe downstream of you. All of these teams need to be working together and they need to be feeding into the same pool of knowledge, right? And learning from each other's experiences. So how did they then go about doing this? So as Lauren sort of alluded to, uh, one of the things that they were able to do was to implement a ramped up plan. Um, and so this didn't intentionally at the time sort of follow the SAMA framework that Lawrence discussed, um, but there's quite a lot of commonality and alignment, and so it's quite an interesting comparison to draw. So in the first phase of their DOE rollout, they focused on two key groups within their organization and two sites, uh, geographically separated sites, and they identified a small number of proof of concept experiments that would allow them to First of all, just assess whether it was possible to substitute their current ways of working with a DOE process and a DOE workflow. They initially identified six super users, so those, those, innovative, those innovators who were going to test the water, if you like, and, and just kind of push the boundaries of DOE and also of synthase as well and see how well this was able to address their challenges. We then moved into the augmentation phase where they started to expand the number of users who were implementing DOE. So bringing in those scientific teams, those lab scientists who are at the bench um, running their assays, running their work and, and allowed them to start to uh, modify some of the ways that they were working and really embed DOE into those processes. They also began as part of this to bring in other in internal teams um, and other resources for uh, training people on design experiments and we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit more in a second. And then finally for phase three, uh, they're looking now at bringing in DOE across multiple teams, so not just the team that we started with but other departments. Uh, and they've seen some real, really interesting modifications to uh, the way that they bring on new members of staff and so now um, automation and, and DOE as well are really uh, a starting point for scientists in this particular group. Um, we're also starting to see uh, the introduction of new ways of working, 
and it's really fascinating i think i've worked very closely with them but it's really fascinating to see that happening as well and really see how doe has allowed this change uh, and they're now looking at 50 plus users and have really rolled this out quite widely across the department so. Now, within this ramp plan, it's it's very easy to say, we're gonna have six users for this amount of time and then 20 and then 50, but it's not quite that simple, right? You can't go from 20 users to 50 users overnight. Um, it takes some structure, even within this ramping, even within each distinct phase of your ramped plan. And so what Lauren talked about earlier is this idea of uh, really understanding your why, but also defining it properly and measuring it as well. Um, and we've seen that uh, organizations who are successful in doing this do this consistently and continuously. And so throughout each phase of this ramp plan, they're constantly asking questions of, well, what are my metrics now? What does success look like now? And revisit that and come back to it. And I've got here just a, a few examples of what some of those metrics look like. The second point here is that, again, throughout this ramping phase, one of the things that was really core to this DOE rollout was to focus on the people, right? And we'll look a little bit more in a second about um, the right people at the right time, but part of the ramping was not just ramping the DOE deployment, but also the training plan as well. And having a training plan uh, is, is really critical. And that can come in a number of different forms. It can be from internal training resources. It can be from working with vendors like us, or maybe if you're doing DOE, you're using Jump, for example. Um, but always consider how you're going to train people and how you're going to up continuously upskill people as your DOE uh, rollout sort of expands. And then finally, Throughout this whole process, this, this phase plan, there was always a lot of uh, discussion and, and caution in a way to make sure that that expansion, that rollout happens gradually. And one thing that we observed, which was really, I think, quite key, is to ensure that the most critical thing is not that you stick to your planned rollout. It's that you roll out when you're ready and you roll out at the right time to ensure that there is time for that cultural change and that shift in mindset from how you were doing things before to now using DOE and sort of give that time to mature almost. And so really valuing the stability of your rollout above your rollout plan is, is quite crucial. Uh, so the other thing, as I sort of touched on a second ago, is that back to Lauren's point as well, is that throughout the entire rollout process, first and foremost was always the people. So bringing in the right people at the right time, but also making sure that you communicate relentlessly as Lauren said. Now, for this in this particular case, this took the shape of a number of different things, um, but they were able to continuously uh, set up a forum for the sharing of knowledge and experiences. Um, now that could be simple things like oh i identified this easier way of doing something in our doe software or more uh, high level sharing of work or particular assays or results that have been worked on we also saw communication uh, throughout between other departments um, and maybe those departments aren't ready to do doe just yet but that conversation is always happening and the same with leadership as well there was communication in both directions at all times. Uh, and then finally, they've really had a, a focus on documenting all of this. So being really meticulous in writing down and, and capturing all of those learnings and all of the different um, information or documents that people have maybe put together on guidelines on how to do something. So communication is really key. The other thing that we saw is that they did a really great job of creating ownership. And this came from two different directions. First off, we saw that there was some top-down um, sort of leadership on the implementation of DOE. And this really helped to form a, a cohesive plan of what they wanted to achieve. But then they gave their lab scientists and the, the people sort of in the trenches, if you like, uh, the opportunity um, and the freedom to really drive 
where they applied DOE and how they went about doing that. And this created an environment where people are able to be creative and, and feel like they are part of that process. And that seemed to help sort of give people buy-in and, and commitment to go away and learn about DOE themselves or to work together to build that up whilst all moving towards the same goal. And then finally, they asked for help. As I say, DOE is hard. Um, statistics can be intimidating if you're a biologist. And so they made sure throughout this to engage uh, with vendors like ourselves, but also with internal resources. Um, so they had a statistics department who helped support and um, educate on, on how to negotiate some of the more technically challenging uh, aspects of design experiments. And so with all these things in mind, I just want to highlight some of the impact that this organization has seen. Um, and I think for me, the, the really big one uh, at the top here is the cultural change. So they set out to try and embed DOE uh, in their ways of working. And I think so far, it's fair to say that they're really seeing this happen. So DOE is becoming a go-to methodology for a lot of the uh, scientific research. We've also seen uh, a real cultural change in the way that they communicate with each other and they communicate with other teams. Um, so the statistics team that I mentioned, but also that DOE is always at the forefront of their mind, right? It's always their go-to. And this is really reflected in the increase in adoption of DOE. So they've seen a ninefold increase in number of DOE users over the period of this ramping process with approximately 90% of experiments uh, being performed uh, with DOE on Synthesis platform, which is obviously really great to see. Um, but what this has sort of given them in terms of real true scientific value is the ability to more confidently make scientific decisions, right? And so when they're handing over a package of work uh, to somebody downstream, what they used to find when they were doing sort of things to, through OFAT or, or other um, optimization methods was that there was always this continued back and forth of, oh, well, the assay you've given us doesn't quite work, but did you test this thing or did you test this buffer or this reagent, let's say. Whereas now they're able to use using DOE very robustly and efficiently map their experimental space and answer all those questions before they come up. Right? They, can, they can test a lot more factors and then ultimately, give a more robust and, and thorough answer. So hopefully that kind of gives you a bit of an idea of what we've seen change management look like in large pharma. I also just want to take a minute to discuss the other end of the spectrum. So looking at our small biotech. So as you can imagine, um, being in a small company comes with its own challenges as well. And, and those, uh, impact how you can roll out technology in that company and uh, so, you know, the case here uh, the company is very small um, they don't have loads and loads of resources like a large pharma company might uh, but also there's a difference in what they value and what they really value is this is speed right the ability to be able to quickly make robust decisions um, and less important to them is this idea of stability so you know, if you're a startup company, knowing that you'll be able to do DOE in 10, 15 years time is a lot less important than, than knowing you're going to be able to raise money and you're going to be able to deliver the results that you need to do that. Um, interestingly, the, some of the biological challenges are similar. So they're working in a highly complex biological space as well, uh, doing bioprocess development. So a lot of those, those challenges are shared. But there are some differences. So they work in a much less established scientific field, and so there's not a wealth of literature. Um, it's hard sometimes to, to know uh, the process so well. And they also have very long experimental timelines. So whilst it might, it might take a day maybe to execute an assay, it can take two to three weeks for them to go through an experimental process. What this means is that when they're implementing DOE, they really need to get as much information as possible out of every experiment that they do. They 
they can't afford uh, to waste three weeks more time there. So the way that this is then reflected in their rollout is fairly similar um, to our large pharma company. So they still were able to implement a ramped plan, but a lot of the points we saw around um, communication and really having a, an infrastructure for rollout is, are quite different. So in phase one, they really focused on just one key user and one or two key protocols. In phase two, they were able to then uh, get good results from that, those key protocols that they focused on early on. Um, but they're not looking at this point to expand their user base, more they're trying to look at how they can uh, implement DOE in a wider range, a wider range, beg pardon, of uh, different use cases. And then finally in phase three, they're starting now to see uh, an expansion of uh, other users who are interested in using DOE. And it has also opened up uh, some different scientific areas that they may be interested in applying the, the approach to as well. Interestingly, what we've seen here though, is that throughout these three phases, we've had one super user who's really been able to lead and, and drive this uh, implementation of DOE, largely because it's it's a small organization, right? There aren't hundreds of people who need to be communicated with and educated on DOE all the time. There's a, there's a lot fewer people in their teams. So whilst I think there is some commonality here, uh, between large pharma and uh, a small biotech, there are a few differences. Um, one is, I think, fairly obvious. The need to prioritize quite ruthlessly is far more important if you're a very small organization. Uh, and this was the case both for their scientific experiments that they were looking at, but also in the number of users that they looked to develop and train uh, for um, being that source of knowledge for DOE. Uh, finally, well, sorry, not finally, they also looked to create ownership, but they did this in a slightly different way. Um, in a small biotech, as you am sure you can imagine, it's a lot easier to identify those one or two key people who are going to put their hand up and say, hey, I really think this is cool technology and I want to be involved. Um, I think the challenge here is maybe just uh, having the time and the capability of uh, availability to really get stuck in and, and devote some time to learning DOE. Um, and then the final point here is that, and this was quite an interesting observation, is that although you're in a small organization, measuring and quantifiable metrics is still just as important. At some point you have to go to your boss and you have to justify why they should be spending money on DOE or whatever technology you're looking to bring in. And so measuring those things is never a bad thing. Um, so I also want to just walk through a little bit here uh, the value that they've achieved, because I think, again, there's some commonality here. Um, one is that they were able to uh, implement DOE quite successfully, and they're starting now to see it become more widely used. It's also opened up different avenues of research and of scientific interest that maybe wouldn't have been considered before. And when you're a small company, this can be a really key competitive advantage um, in you know, building your, your presence in the market and, and having that, that edge on the, on the competition. We've also seen that uh, when it comes to adoption and education, that your super users can become a real key point of knowledge and it's important to uh, give those people the time and space to do that. But we've seen that by doing so, they're able to start uh, fostering adoption of, of DOE within the wider group, but that there's less need for a structure and a routine, uh, a sort of established way of doing that. And then finally, for them, I think the ability to implement DOE uh, consistently has ultimately enabled them to save time and save money. So DOE is all about efficiency and decision making. Um, they've really been able to achieve that. Um, so it's all about getting more information from fewer experiments and 
that's that's been a really great valuable thing for them. So in summary, I think there are some similarities here and they're kind of captured in the, the three key points that Lauren uh, mentioned earlier in the talk, which are know your why. It's really critical that everybody is, is working towards the same mission and everybody understands why they are bothering to change the way that they work, right? So having a goal that is in, inspiring and gonna really capture people's enthusiasm is, is really critical. Uh, build this, build a ramp plan as well, right? So do this in a way that allows you to uh, ease yourself into that process. Um, don't try and run before you can walk, basically. And then finally, focus on the people. People are critical to everything that we do in science. So make sure you're bringing in the right people at the right time and you'll be successful. I do now just want to touch on a couple of differences that we've seen um, if we're comparing DOE adoption across different scales. Um, and this is, so there's a few differences here. One is that um, depending on the scale you're working, the importance of stability and um, sort of future-proofing your organization for change management may be important or it may not. Uh, there is also going to be different constraints on you in terms of the resources that you have. So if you're in a small biotech company, the chances that you have a statistics department that you can go and speak to for DOE help is, is probably pretty small. Um, and then also that communication is always key, right? But the scale and the, again, the structure that you need around how that communication happens may be very different. What we've seen is that in terms of both communication and also change management, smaller organizations tend to be able to rely on natural modes of communication, so word of mouth, people discussing um, key data or insight, and you need less structure, you need less planning around how that communication happens. So with that, I hope I've given you all a, a bit of an insight into some of the uh, experience that we have here at Synthase and how we've seen DOE rolled out successfully within our client base. Um, I'd just like to take a moment to thank a number of organizations who've been really key in providing us with, with feedback and, and sharing some of their stories on um, how they use DOE. Uh, and then also some people internally to Synthase who have been real champions of DOE. Uh, it's always been, like as Lauren said, part of the fabric of the company. And these people here have really helped to make that happen.